the ROI on creating life memories and enjoying life is basically infinite. What's up, everybody? My name is Mike Shogren here with my co-host, Emmanuel Pani. We're part of a group of specialized real estate investors you've probably never heard of. We didn't start with deep pockets or wealthy families, and we don't rely on 401ks, mutual funds, or traditional real estate investing. In fact, many of us don't even own the properties that fund our freedom. If you ask the money experts out there, they'd say what we do is impossible, yet it's happening every single day. It's happening through a new niche called short-term rentals. We are Short-Term Rental Nation, and these are our secrets. What's going on, STR Nation? Welcome back to another episode of the Short-Term Rental Secrets Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Shogren, here with my main man and brother from another mother, Mr. Emmanuel Pani. What's up, E? My brother. So good to see you. Um, Thanksgiving is right around the corner. I am excited, but not ready at all this year. I don't know. It's kind of like, I'm like, I look up and blink and all of a sudden I'm like, shit, it's, it's Thanksgiving next week. So we have a bunch of family and friends coming into town and just really looking forward to it. Um, and just trying to get myself ready to unwind and just like enjoy people. Um, so that's always, that's always fun, you know? I just had a lot of stuff, like a lot. It's funny because once you really start trimming down the fat of what you do and really start getting like laser focus, it's funny how like, and we talk about this all the time, but it's just stuff just falls into your, your, your lap, right? And just being able to like now know like when to say yes and how to say yes and, and how to not overwhelm the team as well. Um, that's, that's a big component because again, like as operators, we are not, we're nothing without the team. And so like being able to like sustain a sustainable growth for the team without overwhelming anybody. Um, yeah, it's, it's difficult and just hiring quality and just, you know, that chicken and the egg, like, do you hire the team or do you get out of the overwhelm moment and then hire the team when you have more time? Like what, what comes first, you know? Um, so that's really a lot of what we're going through on our side. It goes um, back to what we talked about on our boardroom call today, right? Just figuring out the timing and then setting your standards that you only work with A players on your team. Like exactly. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. But it's, it's, it's learning because like, I think people don't um, realize that like up until a couple of years ago, you and me were just you and me and like the team wasn't all of this. Right. And like, even like I posted a poll on my, on my Instagram, we're repainting the villas. It's a 10 building. It's a $65,000 kind of paint job. And so we just went and posted it. And I was like, guys, give me your opinion. And I'm like, because at the end of the day, we're like, I don't know. Like, I don't know what's going to look good. And it's a big thing. And you just like rely on people. Like, make sure that like you surround yourself with really, really quality people. Um, and then just execute and just execute quickly. Because if not, the overwhelm is it's, it's a real thing, you know? Yeah. Um, but what's, what's, what's new with you? Uh, just getting ready, man. Just waiting on the last couple pieces to line up for the, the financing on this next hotel deal. Just yeah. zip so, like, over what, here. what have you been like, like tell people like now, like, you know, like for the last couple of weeks where financing is ready, what do you do in the, in the meantime? Like, what did your day look like today? So this, What's this one's a little different. Most of my days, honestly, are just meetings. Like straight up like between the team and then uh met with an engineer and an architect today because we're basically like rebuilding 27 units out of the 57 like from we're ripping it to the studs and rebuilding them yeah. and then we put together like a master plan because there's room for i just found out today like another 60 something units on the land so just working through that whole master plan and line all that stuff up um still just waiting on two more things because the way that we funded this was through like an SBA product. So like the bank takes 30% and the SBA takes 50%. So we got the bank commitment letter just waiting on the, the SBA. And I think they're just waiting on the appraisal, which they should have because the bank has yeah. it and uh, the environmental, the phase two. So. Yeah. And it's so funny to see like, you know, how many, like the 60 thing is just like, you're like, well, I can do it now, but you also have to understand like, like Mike does, it's just understanding like, it's in the future, so we got to plan it now. Yeah, you don't want to build something and then be like, "Oh shit, I got to rip that apart." 
because it doesn't yeah. tie into the bigger picture later. So exactly. So really doing that work, which is kind of like you're like, oh, I, I, I don't need to do that right now. Whereas instead, it's just like going that little bit extra mile and you're just like, OK, how am I designing this 60 to then make sure that this rest new 60 that I may build later down the road kind of fit into this as well? Yeah, so it's it's never ending. I love it. It's yep. fun. It's fun. It's fun. Cool. Well, uh, I'm excited today because this is definitely a relevant topic. Uh, we're going to be talking about 1031 exchanges. Ooh. And uh, I won't get into the details just yet until we bring up our guest. But today we've got Dave Foster on the show, and he is a qualified intermediary, which is very important for this, which you'll find out very soon. But he's a qualified intermediary uh, investment professional that understands that real estate's really an investment in your future is a multi-industry visionary. He has 20 years of experience working in all phases of real estate investing. Commercial to residential, he brings his clients a fresh perspective and a clear vision for strategic development. He's an investor himself, so he brings that viewpoint to each deal, whether historical or ecologically sensitive projects, fix and flips, rental portfolios, vacation and resort property developments, management, the whole shebang. Um, He's built his reputation on being a driven, results-oriented qualified intermediary who works relentlessly to optimize value for the real estate investors with whom he works. He is inspired by a genuine desire to help investors excel, and he continuously strives to create win-win situations. He recently launched the 1031investor.com to give investors instant access to the information they need to succeed with 1031 exchanges. Dave, welcome to the show, sir. Wow. I just got tired of listening. I need a breath there. Holy smokes. (laughs) Yeah, I you know it realized I I guess I must just be really old. <laughs> all that. Very wise, very uh, wise. There we go. I'll take that. I'll take yeah. that. So why don't, you, here, why don't you like walk us back, man? Because you you've led many lives in this in this space. So like, how did you get involved with real estate at the beginning? Yeah, this is actually kind of a neat story because my career as a qualified intermediary is really just dovetailed and an outgrowth of my own personal journey as an investor. So it all started about 25 years ago when my wife and I were the double income, no kid, no kid kind of thing. And we, we had our first child. And it was right at that moment that we realized when you have children, you no longer need a TV. It's just, they're the best thing in the world. You just want to watch them. And we began realizing that the most important commodity that anybody has in their life is not money. It's not success, title, or anything. The most important commodity you have is time. And that is a finite resource. You just don't know how finite. So we said, how can we get off the corporate wagon here and start to create a life that's going to let us maximize our time to spend with our children as we grow forward? And so like all kinds of investors today, real estate investors, folks looking at the fire movements, all of these kind of things, we've kind of gravitated towards the same idea that throughout history, the two people who have two types of people who have always ruled the world, banks and landlords, real estate. So we said, great, real estate's going to be our ticket out. Let's do it. And I am a huge proponent of the philosophy of ready, fire, aim. So I just jumped in, bought a piece of property, fixed it up, sold it. Awesome. Until I went to my accountant that winter (laughs) and he said, man, are you going to owe so much in tax? And it was right at that moment that I realized that every real estate investor has a silent partner and their name is Uncle Sam. And sometimes Uncle Sam makes more money than you do. And so that was like, that was a real sucky moment. It was like, man, this is going to put us back decades in finding this freedom. But it was right at that moment that a huge court case was settled that filtered down to me where this thing called a 1031 exchange, which had been in the statute since 1920, but the IRS lost a massive court case. And now instead of it only being available to very high net worth, simultaneous transaction type investors. It was going to be available to regular folks like you and me 
to sell investment property and then go and buy investment property. And by doing so, you get to indefinitely defer paying the tax. And when I saw that, my gosh, the light just clicked on because what could I do? What could you do? If every investment you make was guaranteed to get you 20 to 40% more return. It's not a bad deal, is it? And so that was right when we embarked on that journey. And it culminated 10 years to the day of being able to cast off the dock lines on our sailboat down near Emanuel and live on a tax-free bought sailboat, raising four boys, using income from a vacation rental portfolio without ever paying a penny in capital gains tax. Mm. Hot damn. Who wants that life? Who yeah, wants that life? Doesn't that sound like the perfect, like... Sounds like a Hallmark movie. Florida. That's yeah. a postcard from Florida. You know what I mean? There's like, Florida, come live on a boat with your kids and don't pay any taxes. <laughs> what I'm still trying to figure out to this Florida. day is how a girl from Minnesota, a guy from Kansas who met in Colorado, ended up on a sailboat in Key West. <laughs> I mean, like you're you're just blessed like that. I don't I don't think there's too many questions about it. You know, what I mean, it's been such a like, and I I love one. I um I think if I had kids or when we have kids, I would still need a TV just to park the kids in front of it. I think that's my <laughs> my style of parenting. I don't know if I, but I'll remember you in that. We're gonna, I'm gonna get so much hate on yeah. this podcast from yeah. all the parents like he has no idea what the hell he's talking about no, he, no. way like, past the statute of limitations here for yeah. child services but you know the sailboat the thing called the mast yeah that goes way up in the air so there's this thing called a bosun's chair which is just a seat that you tie on to the rope that pulls the sail up we didn't need a tv we would stick our kids in the bosun's chair and it was their own private gym set Nice. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Okay. So I want to unpack this real quick just Absolutely. to kind of give that high level explanation of what a 1031 exchange is. And right, it's basically like normally when you go to sell a property, and again, we don't need to get way into the weeds on this, but depending on how long you've had it, when you sell it, if the value went up and you made a profit, you owe capital gains tax or different tax, depending on how long you've owned it. Correct. Right. Correct. Well, well either that or. If you've owned that property long enough, you have taken the tax write-off called depreciation. Mm -hmm. And this is a nasty little secret that the IRS does not tell you, that the gift of depreciation, the current tax write-off, when you sell that property, they make you pay it back. So, so for all of our cost seg advantage. folks out there that are accelerating that depreciation, and then you go to sell it, if you don't go down this path of a 1031, you owe Uncle Sam quite a bit of cash. <laughs> Massive. Massive yeah. amounts. Yeah, this is the 1031 exchange, particularly now that the IRS has ruled that cost segregations can be included in a 1031, has made it absolutely essential. If you mm -hmm. sell without doing a 1031 and you've cost segged and you've made some money, you're in a world of hurt if you don't do yeah. the 1031. Yeah. So, so what the we're talking about this. Yeah, I was, no, what I was saying is we were talking about this offline. So like, let's say somebody did the cost tag and that's their exit plan. And they have that as an exit plan, like maybe a year or two from now. What are some of the things that they should already be thinking about? Okay. Like to do a 1031, I need to make sure I do what? Right. So yeah, there's a couple of things. They, they just sort of the things you don't do. Don't wait too late. Do not wait too late. Now, the qualified intermediary is the person that the IRS requires to do your 1031 exchanges. They have to be an unrelated third party. So the only role that we fill is performing the 1031 exchange. But every sale in 1031 has to have an intermediary. So I'm kind of like Switzerland. You have to use me, but I'm everybody's friend. Mm -hmm. But we have to be involved prior to the closing of the sale. So I still get calls every month. Hey Dave, I sold the property a couple of weeks ago. I'm ready to do a 1031. Uh, no, you're not. You're done. Got to be in place prior. So you cannot wait too late. 
Yeah. But and why, and why is that? Like, why does it have to be in place prior? Because I think people don't understand, like, in, 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 in my limited education of it, the, the main kind of like little catch is that you, the individual, cannot in any way, shape, or form put your fingers on that money. And that's Correct. Me, like one of the main things that people don't understand. And kind of in the similar example that you were giving, why was that too late? Because maybe that gentleman had the money in his pocket already, right? Yeah, there's two types of receipt of the money. There's actual receipt where the check or the wire goes into your account mm -hmm. and you've got it. But there's also a thing that the IRS calls constructive receipt. And that's where, technically speaking, you may not have the money, but it's under your control. Mm -hmm. So if you left it at the title company mm -hmm. and you call them up a week later and say, can I have my money now? They're going to give it to you. Mm -hmm. That's control of the, uh, that's constructive receipt. And the IRS will not let you have either actual or constructive receipt of the money when you do a 1031. The other half of it is that there's some very specific documentation that has to be part of every transaction in a 1031. And so if you closed your sale, that transaction wasn't in place, most notably because your intermediary wasn't in place. Mm -hmm. So it's the documentation. And it's the it's constructive and actual receipt of the funds mm -hmm. that you have to avoid. But okay. going further back, the thing with 1031, and I think we'll get into some of this today, is that there's so many strategic opportunities, directions you can take that all involve that, that as you're developing your strategy, you kind of want to know how that 1031 is going to play into that. What's that going to cause you to need to do ahead of time? What kind of properties are you going to need to look at? How do you want to structure your financing? All of these kinds of things are huge. And just like you guys know, the last thing you want to be doing is putting this kind of information together at the last minute. So you want to start your planning early, early, early to get the 1031 going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So essentially, guys, what we're talking about is like when you go to sell the property and you're using that money to go buy another investment property, there's this 1031 exchange. So you're not going to pay tax on it because you're rolling it into another like kind investment. But there are some parameters around that. And right, Dave, correct me if I'm wrong, but it has to be, do you have to roll the entire amount? It has to be equal or greater size property. That's one of the strategic decisions you can make. Because if you want to defer all tax, you have to purchase at least as much as you sell and you have to use all the cash to do it. But many times there's a strategic decision to say, I need this much money to be used over here. I've calculated what's going to cost me tax-wise. I'm willing to pay tax on that amount. And so they'll take that amount out of the 1031. Mm -hmm. Those kinds of decisions are all just part of that, part of that process. So the cool thing is if you're looking long-term, and again, it depends on what your long-term plan is, but the idea with something like this is if you plan to be in the real estate game essentially forever, you're going to keep reinvesting in more and more properties and bigger properties. And then the kicker is, and again, Dave, correct me if I'm wrong. At some point, whenever your time comes and you pass, that tax essentially gets wiped if you pass it to your kids. Right? Uh, now, yeah, actually, you just stole my thunder, but that's okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, uh, well, there's this, thing, there's this thing we call the four Ds of 1031 investing. And let me preface this whole thing by saying 1031s are nothing more complicated than an exercise in compound interest. Instead of paying the tax to the government, you use that tax for your benefit to make more money. And then again, you use the money that you made off the deferred tax to go make money for yourself. And it just compounds. We've got some striking spreadsheets that we've put together that show the difference between someone who pays the taxes they go, just like a normal American, and someone who does 1031 exchanges. And over the course of 20 years, in five transactions, the investor doing 1031 exchanges is in control of almost $11 million more, I'm sorry, $7 million more real estate 
than the investor who pays the tax because all of that deferred tax is used as down payment leverage mm -hmm. on the new property. So it's huge that way. So the four Ds are obviously the first ones defer because any day that you don't pay tax is a day you get the interest off of it. And it's a good day now, also. And that's a very good day. <laughs> Some people like us try to do it our entire lives. Hell Some yeah. people say, well, I, I, you know, I do it for five or 10 years and then I get tired and I want to go invest in stocks or something. And 1031 is only for investment real estate. Mm -hmm. But like I said, any day is a good day when you're doing for a tax. The second D is also defer. Because as you go through what I call the life cycle of a real estate investor, um, you will change strategies, tactics, dreams, goals. I imagine you guys have a lot of investors working with you right now that started out simply having one little single family rental. Maybe they got married. They each had their own house. They get married. They move into one. They're accidental landlords. But sooner or later, that stops being fun. And they start to look for greener pastures. I'm so totally guilty of this. And that's why I've done so many things. Because I got a short attention span. And I'm adrenaline junkie. So I moved from short, from uh, single family rentals to multifamily, to historic renovations, to vacation rentals, to raw land and construction development. Just because it was fun. You can do the 1031 exchange to move your real estate from any location in the United States to any other location, from any type of investment real estate to any other type. So if you're a San Francisco investor that enjoyed the five kajillion percent appreciation you've gotten over the last 10 years, maybe it's time now to sell that and do a 1031 exchange into Omaha, Nebraska, where the cash flow is better. Or maybe you're tired of active management. So it's time to invest in a tenants in common project or a multifamily project where you have centralized management. The 1031 exchange will accommodate wherever you're wanting to go. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you guys think? What's the third D? Decide. Steven, what do you think? <laughs> uh, it's an OP. Can you come in with the win? Uh, I don't know why delays coming to my head, but I know it's not right. Well, that's actually, well, that's actually a strain on the word. It's also defer. Oh, okay. defer, defer, <laughs> defer. Oh, Jesus. Because as you, you threw me for a loop, I was I'm just thinking of another D. I'm like depreciation? No. I mean, well, kind of, yeah, but depression? No. <laughs> depression. And <laughs> yeah, that's if you pay the tax. Um, as you get further along in your journey, you're going to want to start looking at things like retirement and like passive for sure. And there are opportunities if you plan ahead of time to use your is your real estate portfolio near where you want to retire or to position it such that you can slowly begin to carve out even chunks of that tax-free. And this is what I think we're going to talk about maybe a few minutes, the conversion thing we talked about at the end of the show. But those are the first three defers. And then the last D, and I'm not even going to ask, you've already said it, Stephen, the last defer is die. Defer, 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 and then die. And it's not my favorite, but we're all heading there anyways. Because when you die, your heirs get the property at what's called a step up in basis. Which means they inherit it and all the depreciation, recapture goes away. All of the tax on gain goes away. You don't pay it. Your estate doesn't pay it. Your heirs don't pay it. It's truly tax free. And we have investors that are on their second and third generation of passing money or property down this way. Grandpa did 1031s. He gave it to his son. His son started over, did 1031s, passed it to his children. His children again got it tax free, 
and now they're doing their own. So what an awesome opportunity to defer that tax and use it for yourself your entire life and then give it to your heirs and uh, let them yeah. establish that. To me, that sounds like the textbook definition of generational wealth right there. Mm -hmm. It's like, I pass it down. Um, one of the things that we were talking about off air that I kind of want to tie in now based on that was you mentioned that you were in vacation rentals or short-term rentals, the personal use side of it, right? If, it, if you invest in these and you 1031 from a three bedroom into some 10 bedroom beach house, just throwing out numbers here, right? Can you use that property? Absolutely. You can. What qualifies a property for 1031 exchange, 1031 treatment, or actually let me rephrase that. What qualifies a property for investment treatment? So you can depreciate it. So you can write off expenses against income. Obviously, take the mortgage GP interest deduction and write off business trips to go see your properties. That's pretty key. Is that the property is held for productive use in business investment or trade? Now, that means that you're trying to make money off of it. There is actually a safe harbor from the IRS in Revenue Procedure 2008. Dash 16, if there's any nerd out there that wants to look it up. And that says that you can use a property. The IRS will guarantee that it's an investment property. If you use the property for personal use, no more than two weeks a year or 10% of the number of days it's actually rented. And none of those days count when you're staying in it and working on it. So in other words, I've got investors that will go spend significant amounts of time at their vacation rentals every year, but they take a paint can and a hammer with them. Mm -hmm. And well, well, that's a guarantee from the IRS. Mm -hmm. You do yeah. one nail a day. You just hammer in one nail a day, paint one strip of paint, and then that's it. I mean, I got people. That's why he has all these random stripes on his property. <laughs> <laughs> you can't remember what it's like. It's random nails sticking out everywhere. He's just like, damn, he, what's going on? It's just like, oh, you know, just yeah. constantly working on this property of mine, you know? Yeah, that's exactly right. Now, what's really kind of cool, guys, is for the vacation rental people, I get this question all the time. But Dave, investment rates are too high. I want to buy this using second home financing. Now that doesn't sound like that would work with a 1031, does it? But let's think about what the criteria are typically for second home financing. Usually the only difference is that number one, the property be at least a hundred miles away from where you live. And number two, that you agree to use it for personal use two weeks a year. Mm -hmm. Which is the same so, as on the site. That's exactly right. Yeah. It can absolutely meet that safe harbor. Mm -hmm. So you can use very favorable second home financing. You can use the home for personal use and still have a classified as an investment. Mm -hmm. What a great strategy. That's why, I love this. that's why I love this niche, man. There's so many benefits. Um, one of the things they that we didn't talk about and that I think we should talk about in terms of, and we can do it super quickly, in terms of people understanding what is required, um, you cannot just put money into a 1031 exchange for an indefinite amount of time, right? There is also a time restrictions at the beginning that is also part of the reason why, again, I think we have knocked this concept pretty deep in, in the show overall. Part of success in real estate is it's planning and thinking ahead. So in 1031s as well, like, okay, you do it, you hire an intermediary, good job so far, but you haven't started looking at a single property. You have no idea of what market you want to invest in. Now you text Mike and you would like, Mike, what's the best vacation rental market? Or you text, you know, and you like start searching. Why could that be a problem? Right, by the way, first of all, Steven, I'm really sorry that I called you Steven. When you're really Michael. 
<laughs> no problem. I thought you were about to my chops earlier, so I was like, oh, all right, we'll roll with it. We'll roll with it. Oh, my gosh. It's the guy who's sitting on your shoulder. I don't know if that's the devil or the <laughs> angel. His name is Steven. Uh, thanks for that. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right, Emmanuel. So there's a clicking talk, and it's a time bomb. And it starts with the day of the closing of your sale. Mm -hmm. You've got 45 days to identify your potential replacement property. And that's it. So if you let yourself get too close to that day and you throw a property on there and you get outbid for it and you're now past day 45, your 1031 is over. Yeah. And can you tell them, like, can you explain what does identify mean? Like, meaning, does that mean close or does that mean just find? Yeah, it's literally just a, a written list. And it's, it's got some limitations on it that are pretty strict that we have time to mess with today. But you are not you can't just put the entire LA phone book in, on your list. Mm -hmm. So you have just a very few properties. If you get outbid for them and you are still in day 45, go name some more properties. But if you're past day 45, you're stuck. And you only have 180 days to close. Now, 180 to close isn't so bad unless you're trying to work with some new construction or something like that. But 45 days will get you every time. Mm -hmm. And honestly, the only people that I have ever seen really struggle with getting a 1031 done are those people that are not laser focused on where they want to go and what they want to go into. Yeah. Those two things will kill you. I had one lady from San Diego. Was, oh, I'm so excited. I'm thinking to maybe go short-term rental in Gatlinburg. I'm looking at Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. Although really something here in San Diego would be nice. And I'm kind of thinking commercial property might be nice too. I mean, mm -hmm. I guaranteed everybody hers was going to fail. And sure enough, it did. Because there's no way you can do enough due diligence during that time to get a good property located. And fortunately for her, she made the right choice of letting it die because it's never the deal you don't get that kills you. It's the deal you do get that you shouldn't have. Mm. And although it may feel like paying tax on profit is going to make you go broke, no one ever went broke paying tax on profit. I'm glad you brought that up, right? Yeah. We were talking about that in the boardroom three yeah. weeks ago. So we've at our yeah. highest level mastermind, somebody was, doing a 1031 and they were sharing some properties they were looking at and they're like, yeah, the cash flow, it's a little sketch. And I'm like, it still has to make sense. I know you want a 1031, but if you 1031 into the wrong deal, you're defeating the purpose of the 1031. Like it's going to start costing you money if you get in the wrong deal too. Yeah, that's exactly right. Now, of course, there's all sorts of considerations. Is it worthwhile paying a little bit more? Well, if, think about that cost seg, you know, if that's going to cost me hundreds of thousands of dollars, but I've got an opportunity to overpay by $50,000 here, you know, that made it something to think about. Mm -hmm. If it gives me an opportunity. So what really fascinated me was the deal that you were talking about at the beginning of the show, where you mentioned that you had the opportunity to actually add like 50 or 60 more units. Mm -hmm. Now, Think about that as a play. You could do some math and say, wow, although the cash flow right now might be substandard, what's the end game on this going to be? And that's something that might well be worth 1031 into, even though at the outset, it's not where you want it to be. What I tell people is that you've got to have realistic expectations, never go into a bad deal, but you have to take the market where you find it. If you're in the middle, like we've been for the last five or six years of a huge seller's market and you're selling your property for top dollar, what makes you think that you're going to be able to find a bargain basement value? You know, the best, the best time to start an exchange is when it's a seller's market and you sell at the top, but that's also the worst time to find that cheap hidden gem. So you just have to have realistic expectations because the exact opposite is true. What's happening right now? 
I think we're about to see some softening. So it might become a little more difficult for you to sell your property. You may need to make some adjustments in pricing, but finding your new replacement property is going to become ever so much easier. Mm -hmm. And God bless the investor who sold their property 30 days ago and sold at the top and now has all this time to go wait for the market to come down even more. Being on that shoulder of a market is huge for the 1031 investor. You can't time it, but you can sure. I was going to say, advantage. unfortunately, if we had that crystal ball, we'd all be pretty wealthy right now. But but, but I think I think one of the things that Dave has really like kind of like reminded me on the show so far is one just the good fundamentals of real estate investing. One is the fact that like if a deal don't work. Sometimes there is a reason why and don't break your head trying to make it work because those are the deals that end up hurting you. And two, being realistic with how the rules of life apply to everybody the same way. Meaning like this example that he just gave, right? Like it's just like how unrealistic is it? But yet how many of us listening right now have done that? Or how many of us are in that mindset? Anytime you sell something, you're always like, my stuff, even when you put up a unit, right? Like you, you go live with a property, you're like my stuff is going to be the best. And then it's not, it's not or like the market teaches you. And when it comes to the stock market, people have come so accustomed to like the stock price goes up and down, whatever the stock price is. If you want to sell, that's what it is. We come to real estate and people have opinions and they're like, no, but I think it's worth this much. It's like the market is saying this and you just got to make peace with that. If not, you're just going to wait and wait and wait and wait. Dave, question for you. If yeah. you wanted to invest in a real estate syndication, mm. can you 1031 your money into a real estate syndication? Because there's a lot of people, similar to your example, that maybe have had active portfolios and now they're wanting to sell and they don't want to be active investors anymore. So can they take their money into a syndication? Yeah, it's absolutely a great transition strategy. The answer is maybe, but probably not. And the reason for this is that the 1031 is a sale of investment real estate. You actually have to purchase investment real estate. Most syndications are set up where an LP, an LLC has been created. And that entity owns the real estate. And what you buy is a membership interest in that entity. Mm -hmm. So you can't do the 1031 because selling real estate. But what you'd be buying is a membership interest in an entity that owns real estate and Got not it. the real estate itself. But you last, although, the work, yeah, I was going to say, go you, you mentioned it earlier. So go ahead. I don't want to steal your thunder again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, the hack is that there are a growing number of syndicators who will allow you to purchase a percentage of the real estate itself as a tenant in common. So you sell your real estate, you buy 10% of the syndication's real estate, and now you and the syndication develop it together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So because it has to be under your name also, right? Or like whatever, like you have to be personally like with your name on it. Whoever the taxpayer is. Yeah. Uh, because exactly. any tax paid entity, and this actually is the second, this is for you guys in particular, but the second greatest application here is that we're seeing more and more syndications starting to tip 31 themselves. So if I own a membership interest in your syndication and you find out you want to buy and you decide it's for your old property, then you could sell and the syndication can do a 1031 exchange. I don't have to do anything because I'm just part of the syndication. So you roll all of my money forward along with it. Right. See the power of that. Never the syndication have to keep it though, or could. The syndication doing the exchange. The IRS does not care who the members of the syndication are. So you could, if someone didn't want to go forward, have a, an agreement to buy out their membership interest. 
Mm. But what's awesome, awesome is you guys that have your guaranteed crew yeah. of trusty investors rolling forward tax deferred. Mm. Yeah. And uh, Dave, question for you. You hinted earlier um, about that beautiful postcard for Florida, right? You had the four kids on the boat in the Keys. I think you said the boat was but tax-free. Did you do a 1031 into, into the boat? Not quite. Okay. Sort of. So okay. We start, it's the story. And it's awesome, guys. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, I was hoping there was a story there. Absolutely. So yeah. we started our portfolio in Denver, Colorado. Denver's got two problems. The biggest one is that there's no beach and no place to put a sailboat. So we knew that we had to end up going somewhere else. But while we were in Denver, we were starting to buy our 1031 hold properties. And in addition to section 1031, there's another part of the tax code that deals with your primary residence. And that is section 121. Section 121 allows you to buy a house, move into it. And once you've lived in it for two, out of the five years prior to sale, you get to take, if you're married, the first $500,000 in profit tax-free. And you could do that once every two years. Oh my gosh. I mean, by itself, that's the greatest give me from the IRS ever. Because you'll move eight or 10 times in your life. Well, why not? Why not? Every time you move, it's tax-free. So what we did was while we were in Denver, we moved a couple times. We also, though, at periodic times, converted an investment rental into our next primary residence. Because the conversion of the property, once you established it, you know, it demonstrated your intent. You could convert that property into other use. So we would convert a property from investment into our primary residence. Two years later, we would sell it, and all of that deferred gain was tax-free. Now, this was prior, here's the caveat. This was prior to 2008, when everything was tax-free. I'll, I'll talk about that more in a second. As we got ready, closer to, to going to the sailboat, we had an opportunity to move to Stamford, Connecticut. So ahead of that, thinking about planning, we started to sell and position our portfolio in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And then when we moved to Connecticut, where did I move? I sold my last primary in Denver and I moved into one of my old primary residences and are my old investment properties in Connecticut, converting it again so that two years later it was tax-free. Now there was a problem with stamp Connecticut. Sun never, and it's freaking cold in the winter. We had asked God to give us sailboat water. We forgot to ask for warm sailboat water. So Florida got on the radar screen. And again, we started to transition our portfolio from Connecticut to Florida. And when we finally moved, we again sold our last primary residence. That was tax-free. We moved into one of our Florida investment properties and turned that into our primary residence. Every time we sold one of those converted primary residences, that tax-free money went into the buy the boat fund. Mm. And so 10 years to the day, to the week of setting the goal, we had a vacation rental portfolio that was providing regular income and we had a boat that was bought with tax-free dollars mm. because of the primary residence exemption and converting tax-free dollars or tax-deferred dollars into tax-free dollars. I hear like a Jimmy Buffett song playing on the boat right now. Like <laughs> cold Corona. But you know what's funny? What this reminds me of is people are like, oh, boats are bad investments. And it's just like, yeah, but the beauty about America and the tax system in America and just the laws in general and the loopholes in the system 
is if you know the system, even the thing that people are like, this is not a good investment. Is it a bad investment if it's free? Like if it's <laughs> all from tax-free money, you just need to know how to play the game because like you didn't do anything wrong. You just used the, the tax code the way it was written and you took advantage of it. And there is plenty of people that made live in a house for two years and not understand there's just like there is free money. That's well, why I, I remember. Been, I was oh, just yeah, sorry. I was just gonna say that's why like there's so many levels to this game and like the the importance of having a strong network and mentors and things like that is because once you understand all these puzzle pieces and you have the right people in your corner to ask certain questions, think of the compounding effect over 10, 20, 30, 40 years when you have the right information and you have the right Absolutely. strategies. Like if you're, you know, getting ready to retire and you're learning this stuff, it's too late, really. Like it's like, you got to invest in those relationships and that education now and then let it compound. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, remember, when you're thinking about making a bad investment like a boat, Emmanuel, what was our goal in the very beginning? Freedom and time. Mm -hmm. We wanted to spend time with our family. That let us accomplish that perfectly. Mm -hmm. And I'm the one of those people that actually thinks that that's a great investment. Like, if it's something that gives you... Like, I am... Of and again, I'm I'm on maybe a different spectrum, but like I'm on the proponent that like if money is spent towards enjoyment and quality of living, it's money that is blessed and the return is there. People to me lack the understanding that personal use and enjoyment carries a ROI in it of itself. That oh, to funny. me it's superior to money. Like if I do a 20% cash on cash or a 30% on memories and experience with my family, my friends, the people that I love, and I enjoy my life in the process, the 20% cash on cash to me is not as significant. Obviously different seasons of life, but you guys had a plan. And as my dad loves to say, work, plan the work and work the plan. You guys had it, 10 years, goal, money aside. Anybody that would look at you and be like, that was a stupid investment, I'm like, Great. Look at my kid sail on this thing, go up and down. To me, that's worth more than whatever you would be investing in. And that's oh my gosh, can can I rephrase what you just said? Because I think that is so profound. That the ROI on creating life memories and enjoying life is basically infinite. Yes. I love that. Who that's said that? Name, that's the so name of the game. Like yeah. there are a lot of people that I talk to that are applying to the mastermind or whatever. Everybody says the same two things when I ask what their goal is. I want financial freedom and I want to travel like 99% of the time. And it's like, okay, cool. Well, when you get to that point, go do that then like, and have no right. guilt about it. And for the people that say the boat's a bad investment, you give me a boat, I will find a way to make money with it. I promise you that. I know a guy that bought a $3 million yacht that gets to use it whenever he wants. And then he charters it and he makes really good money on it. So, you put yeah. your entrepreneur hat on, there's ways to make money everywhere. Absolutely. Now, here's maybe a little more middle of the road America twist on this concept that we're starting to see quite a bit. I have a realtor in St. Pete Beach who used the 1031 exchange and he bought three identical beachfront condos on the same floor, basically next door to each other over time. His retirement plan is that he moved into the first one. So he converted property. Remember, he sold his old primary. That's the start of his retirement. Now he's living in this property, still tax deferred. Once he has lived in it long enough, then he will be able to sell it at whatever point he wants. And remember I said pre-2008. Since 2008, you don't get to take all the gain tax free. Somehow the IRS put a poster of me up in their lunchroom <laughs> and I became a target. But now you still get to prorate it. So if he rented that property for two years and then moved into it and he lives in it for five, he will get, when he sells it, 60% of the gain tax free. Now he will pay tax on 20%. Okay. His response to that was, heck, if I retired, I'd have to go delivering pizzas or bag groceries at a grocery store. 
I'm going to pay taxes and get a W-2 for that. This way, I'm going to pay tax for the privilege of just sipping coffee on my back deck watching the ocean. So what a great retirement game. Where is he going to move, guys? When it's time, he's going to move next door and start that clock over again. I asked his wife, how are you going to know when it's time to move? She said, yeah, when it's time to redecorate, we'll just move. And all along the way throughout their retirement, they're going to be carving out chunks of money tax-free, paying a little bit of tax, and living life large, retiring. Yeah. That's available for mainstream America. Yeah. And and I love this. And I know a lot of people, like if you're on the handy side of things, right? So if you listen to me and Mike and we like, we hire the team and the people do stuff, you know, like I love doing the work myself, right? Mike, you're muted. But I love doing the work myself. If you're that person, Dave just gave you a perfect thing where you can just go into a house. There's a fixer upper. Do all the work yourself. Just you have a two year time clock. So you can take as long as you want to do the work yourself and then move every two years, sell the property tax free of all the work you've done, and then just keep doing it. Again, easier with like less of a entourage. Obviously, if you have like two or three kids, wife, and everything else, that gets more complicated. But if you have a spouse that loves the decorating aspect of it and you're a handy guy or vice versa. If you have a husband that loves decorating and you're the handy woman, go ahead and just do this and it's tax-free and it's a great way to build generational wealth for yourself. And without having to like grow and scale and do 1031 into big things, just do it for yourself. And it's the best way for you to like carve out equity out of properties completely tax-free. I am not handy enough to do that. However, I am happy to pay somebody to fix it. I know. Me and you are in that like uh, one nail a day, one strip of paint side <laughs> of things. I, I can't wait that. to see this Airbnb listing. <laughs> <laughs> Called the Zebra House. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dave, I want to be respectful of your time here. But um, before we get yeah. into our last question, first, I just want to say thank you genuinely for coming on here and sharing all this knowledge. I know I got a ton of value out of it. I guarantee the listeners will as well. And hopefully it just... Damn opened up a lot of a lot of eyes to like what's possible when you understand these strategies and what you can do over time. So thank you. Um, so where can folks learn more about you and what you have going on in your QI services? Yeah, so we have tried to make it very easy for folks. We've created a branding called The 1031 Investor. And if you simply go to the1031investor.com, you'll find ways to contact us. Uh, we're always available for live chats, in consultations because honestly i get really bored doing paperwork so please let me strategize with you and uh we've got a 32 part youtube series that dives into all the nuances of this kind of thing um it's not up yet but i just got the galleys back from a book we're writing so maybe i'll ask you guys to have me come back uh when that's completed uh but the 1031 investor.com gets you right awesome. Perfect. Perfect. So the last question that we ask all of our guests, and this will be again, a unique perspective coming from you, but what is your number one secret to success with short-term rentals? Well, back in the day, it was cheating. We were so early in this market doing this kind of thing that we were on the front page of the RBO and there was no such thing as Airbnb. So yeah, we, it was, uh, we just, call it lucky timing. And that's where I think the biggest thing was, and this really goes back to personal use is the best thing you could do as a short term rental landlord is go use your property and use it like a vacationer. That's going to give you the perspective. What's good about it. What's bad about it, what you can fix. And honestly do that before you buy the property even because there's a lot of properties that people are, and what I'm seeing people do is they're, they're just trying to make the numbers work and they want this property, but it's not, the numbers don't work as a rental. Oh, I'll just turn it into an Airbnb because those numbers work, but the property may not be right. So it's gotta be the right property. Use it like a tent. I once had a lady, we had so many fun 
uh, people that came in and used year after year after year because we developed the relationships. And it became their second home. And that's what I loved about it. I had a lady once slip a $20 bill under a wine glass that she broke because she felt so bad about it. When you get tenants like that, that's cold. Mm. 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 Love it. Love it. Well, Dave, again, thank you so much for coming on here. Truly appreciate your time. And uh, for the listeners out there, I hope you guys were taking some notes because this, this was packed full of gems. So thank you so much, Dave. Really appreciate it. My pleasure, guys. Awesome. Good, All Dave. right, everybody. Ciao, Take guys. care. Hey, STR Nation, if you enjoyed this episode, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and leave us a review. And in the comments, let us know what topics you want us to cover on upcoming episodes, and we'll make sure to get that in the books for you. And if you really want to learn how to launch, automate, and scale your short-term rental business, if you want to go deeper, then check out our free masterclass at strsecrets.com.